Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency here with the Earth Systems Update for September of 24. Since June of 23, I've been following the information coming in about rapid unexplained changes to major Earth systems. Since then, I've posted several updates following these changes to ocean temperatures and connecting this information to potential climate system impacts. In March of 24, the evidence became overwhelming to me and I made the call, it was time to get weird. More and more prominent climate scientists are making this call. We can see that in this article in The Guardian by Jonathan Watts, who does some of the best publicly available climate reporting. He quotes here Gavin Schmidt, the director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, pretty reliable source about concerns that if the anomalies we're experiencing didn't stabilize by August, it could imply that a warming planet is already fundamentally altering how the climate system operates much sooner than scientists had anticipated. And we haven't seen notable cooling as the August numbers have come in. We're still coming in at or above 1.5 C over pre-industrial baseline. We do appear to have entered a time where we've hit a tipping point in Earth's climate systems. We aren't able to explain what's happened since May of 23 with our current models. If for a long time, people have been saying faster than expected, I think that we might start hearing that was unexpected. We're entering a new era. The evidence really seems to be coming in around that. I'm going to keep plugging away at putting out 2C information because I really do think it'll help us get going in the right direction, especially as I plan to incorporate what knowledge we have around near-term AMOC collapse modeling. That incorporation is not and will not be in the state-level outlooks, but it will be in the upcoming destination videos. But I think it's important to emphasize, especially as we head past 2C, we're really leaving a lot of our certainty behind. Science is a way to understand the world that depends on reliability and reproducibility. As we leave stability behind, there's a degree to which we also leave behind reproducibility. A lack of reliability and reproducibility is part of why we're bad at understanding hurricanes. There aren't enough of them for us to make super great predictions about them. This spring, meteorologists were predicting that this was going to be a very intense hurricane season. And I shared that on the channel, but that hasn't happened. We haven't had an unusually large number of hurricanes. And as we can see, clearly put in this headline from USA Today, it's because the tropics are broken. I feel like it might be kinder to say the tropics are doing something weird. I mean, they're not doing their usual thing, but who are we to tell the tropics what to do? Let's observe some behavior. Let's look in on some Earth systems together, see what I'm talking about when I say the evidence has very much come together that we've hit a tipping point. Let's look in Climate Reanalyzer. This is a high quality, frequently updated source. University of Maine is in charge of it. Let's look at the graph for daily surface air temperature. So if we look here, the red line is 2024, the orange line is 2023. And we can see that things got strange as we moved from May into June of 23. We start seeing these big gaps, these big gaps between what the temperature was and what it had ever been before. And that is continuing most scarily in February of 24, where we can see this astonishingly large anomaly appearing in February of 24. When we first started seeing these anomaly records, many of us who are interested in climate science were like, what if this is going to keep shooting straight up? In February of 24, in that bump that you see there, we saw four days at or very near to 2C above baseline. It became very clear, more clear to me than ever, the importance of these moments in our lives, the reality of our fragility. And we can see as we look at the red line, as we look at 24, that we're still maintaining those sizable anomalies, but we're not seeing a similar increase in anomaly size. The rate of change seems like it has slowed back down a little back to a more similar rate of change, but that doesn't mean we're getting a cool down. The cool down climate scientists would like to see to counter this anomaly and keep us on the models is not happening. Things are still getting hotter. They're just not getting hotter as fast as during the terrifying peak of this Earth system's change. 
We can also see this when we look at sea surface temperature. This is another moment where we can really visualize the moments where this change became so evident. So looking at this figure, the orange line is 2023, the black line is 2024. And if you look at that orange line over the first few months of 2023, you can see that by the end of May and going into the beginning of June, we were looking at larger anomalies than we would ever conceivably like to see in the daily surface sea temperature. We can see that that sort of unprecedented climb appears to have slowed down, that the rate of change appears to have slowed down, but that we're still looking at very anomalously high ocean temperatures as we move through 24. And I think that it is creepy how relatively flat that line is so far for 24. Bottom line is it's still anomalously hot. The pattern has changed. And we see impacts of this changed pattern most clearly in measurements coming out of Antarctica. Zach here is a visualization expert with NOAA. He's a NOAA climate scientist. And here I'm looking at his visualization of Antarctic sea ice anomalies where we can see that 2023, we saw unusually low Antarctic sea ice by a very large margin, and that we are not really returning to normal in 2024. That in fact, we have it tied up for anomaly size as of today. This is showing a change in pattern related to the melting season for ice in the south of our world. Arctic sea ice is a little bit different. Now we're looking at an Arctic sea ice visualization, and I want you to see how closely this year's information is sticking to the purple line for Arctic sea ice. The purple line is the 2010s mean. That was a while ago now, 2010. That average, the average for the 2010s is lower than what we've been pulling off the past few years. I spoke earlier this year on the channel that we were seeing unusually strong Arctic sea ice during the Northern Hemisphere cold season. You can see here that even as we get to the Northern Hemisphere hot season, although we are seeing lows in Arctic sea ice, we're not busting out a range. We're not seeing a total pattern change in the same way you saw things are just really out there with Southern ice. So this is all pretty intense evidence that we are in a pattern change time. I think the AMOC system is functionally down, which when we talk about the collapse of this ocean current system, which moves warm and cool water through the Atlantic Ocean, we're talking about geologic scale phenomena here. We're not talking about a light switch. The fact that we're not feeling the full effects of the collapse of this system yet would be normal and anticipated. As we can see here in a paper from Nature Climate Change, looking at short-term modeling of what might happen during AMOC collapse, this figure here is specifically focusing on decade-level changes to sea ice and ocean surface temperatures. We would expect in the event of AMOC collapse, not a change like a light switch, we're talking about, again, a geologic time scale issue where we would experience continually intensifying Earth system effects for decades. In our just-in-time culture, many of us feel like if the thing hasn't become immediately obvious, is the change isn't completely done, it must not be happening. I feel like it's worth stating one more time the fact that we're not feeling the full effects of the collapse of this system yet, normal and anticipated. Seeing Earth's climate systems change, seeing these patterns change over the course of a couple of years is already extremely, insanely fast for planetary systems to change. And I think that makes this a very important time. I don't know what's going to come next, but I do know that if there's an after, we're still living in the before. These are still times to be recalled as good times. I do think location will matter as we experience what's coming the dynamic changes that our planet is like to experience as we move towards 2C. And because there's so much pollution in our atmosphere, we can't forget that our planet is going to continue to warm, even though AMOC shutdown is predicted to cause 
northern hemisphere cooling. So we've got two forces in tension against each other, a warming and a cooling force in the northern hemisphere projected. And folks, I know this isn't exactly new information for those of you who are following along, but part of why I put that news story from The Guardian front and center is because I think it's important that there are many climate scientists who want to communicate about the significance of this change. We've all been talking about climate with an everything's on fire level of urgency for quite some time. And that context makes it hard to explain to people that something has really changed, that something is really different. I hope this video helps you to understand that change, that the problem we were looking at here isn't warming, or at least it's not just warming. It's that these deep patterns in the systems have undergone a shift. And how can we get ready in this context when everything is weird? I think we learn what we can, take a look at near terms as best we understand them and the best models we have, and we get weird. Take in information from multiple sources, learn skills with your hands, not so popular today. Our species is a social species. We do better in community than alone. And many of us have forgotten the skills that living in community requires. Those skills matter and practice improves those skills. If you love biodiversity like me, I think it's important to devote ourselves to saving what we can for as long as we can. Even though you're gonna have the weird yard today and maybe people will laugh at you, this is a bottleneck situation. And we know, we know from evolutionary history, we know from Earth's deep history that in bottleneck times, small populations matter. The dozens of species that I have reproducing in my little habitat island matter. Their lives matter. I think many of us now feel a call at this time, a call around our connection to the earth, a desire to live in a way where we can move away from overshoot and take our place in the circle of life. I think many of us have a desire to live in a way that doesn't cause active harm. I know many of us feel these deep impulses and these feelings we have, which are so contrary towards what we are taught to feel in our culture, our culture which disdains caretakers and good stewards, those feelings matter. In a time of radical change, your ability to care for living things might become more important than the car you drive. And also, I think it's important to have fun, to play, to remain curious about life. I know I'm getting a little serious here, but you know we have fun here a lot of the time. And I think it's important to note that that's also something that you can practice. That's also a skill that you can help yourself grow is to reclaim your ability to play, to reclaim your ability to be curious and engaged with the world in a joyful way. That's a thing that we can reclaim. We've had a lot of people join the channel since I released Time to Get Weird. It seems worth talking again, maybe talking a little bit more about what that means to me. The lighthouse we're building here, it can only let us see so far, but it is farther than where we are now. It's probably better than nothing. And you know, I don't want to live in times like these and pretend I'm not weird. Like, gross, we got it. I think it's good to build resilience in times of rapid change. It's about time for me to update and improve what is reasonable prep, but people tell me that has been a useful video to them as they started building household resilience. Building relationships, skills, and resilience matters. Cultivating meaning and an ability to play, even in hard times, matters. These are part of the deep resilience, the resilience on the inside that we need at times like these. That's what I mean when I say, let's get ready. Folks, before we run the credits, I want to give a quick shout out to a volunteer. You may have noticed that the thumbnails for the videos are looking a lot less like they were made by a mad scientist who really prefers all her media as a giant wall of text. That's because JP is helping me out. I wanted to show his YouTube channel here. If you like tabletop games, his content quality is amazing. It's much better than mine. And he's got a cool focus on family play and developmental needs. JP, my kids love your videos. He didn't ask me to do this, folks but I honestly think there's a pretty decent Venn diagram overlap of AR folks and people who would be interested in this content. Now to the credits. 
folks. Thanks for watching. And I want to thank everyone in the AR community for your contributions that are keeping this nonprofit going. If you want to donate, there's a link on the About page of our YouTube channel or on the top bar of our website, www.americanresiliency.org. I'm very grateful to our donors, to our volunteers, to everyone spreading the word online, and especially to everyone doing the work on the ground. Thanks for getting ready with me and talk with you again soon.